Thank you. And All right. Action. And action. I feel like I should tap some papers, you know? Hi, everybody. Welcome to our class. And I say our because my co host is the lovely Ali, uh, uh, Milady Alessandra. Um, so we're going to get our class started real quick. I want to share a screen with you for our um, slideshow here. Um, and get my code. Pardon me for just one more moment while I get myself situated. All right. Great. All right. Welcome to an introduction to horses in history. Um, by myself and Allie. Let me get us there. So we'd like to start this by introducing ourselves a little bit more. Um, I am Her Grace Claire de Lacy of the SCA, uh, Duchess of Artemisia, member of the Barony of Arnhold. Um, I'm also Nikki Schofield, and Nikki Schofield has been a horse lover for a really long time. Um, I have worked in the uh, horse industry. Um, I have my degree and bachelor's of science in um, equine science and reproductive physiology. So I studied horses a lot. I've also had the privilege of working with a lot of different horses and race horses in the past. Um, and moving out west here, my husband and I, Ronan, Duke Ronan, uh, Joe Schofield, we own a horse ranch out here. Um, and so we have a great opportunity to work with horses um, and have a lot of ex experience doing that. Ali. She's muted. Oh, you're muted. Oh, can you hear her though? Nope. Nope. Oh, she can't, we can't hear her. Oh, sorry. Pardon us a moment. Can you hear me now? Hold on, I'm gonna turn mine off. Just one moment, I'm so sorry. How about this? Go for it. Um, so my name's Allie. I have been riding horses my whole life. Um, where we lived before Idaho, my family had a ranch and I used to ride with them. Uh, we moved out here, got my first horse when I was seven, uh, grew up in 4-H, FFA, open shows, rodeo. So I've been involved in horses my whole life and it's been a passion of mine my whole life. Um, I'm currently a rodeo queen. I'm the Murder Lion Rodeo Senior Queen for another half and then I'm on the side um, Aside from horses, I work in a preschool. I absolutely love working with kids. I discovered that in 4-H. So I have really loved working in a preschool. Also a 4-H leader so I get to work with kids all the time and teach them how to ride their horses about horses. Um, Emma, you'll see her a couple of times in my presentation today. She is my horse, one of my two horses. She is my unicorn, is what we call her. She can do anything and everything, and she is also my cart horse. She's uh, amazing. Um, my, I got dragged into the SCA, uh, Roger Crispin. A lot of people know him. He took me to my first event by actually wanted to introduce me to Ronan and Claire and said, you'll absolutely love these people. They've got horses. Let's go. So that was my introduction. So we definitely share a love of horses, um, but I did want to let you know that through this class and through the SCA, when you're interested in horses, there is no requirement for you to have a horse, for you to have experience with horses in order to be interested in the history of horses. Um, so we are super excited, if you can't tell, uh, to share our knowledge of horses with you. Um, and this is our mission, our plan for this class is to engender an understanding of the role that horses played in everyday life during the Middle Ages. Um, the plan also is that this is a survey of horse history, especially in Europe. Because when we started researching this to do this class for you, um, we found that horse history is gigantic. It's huge. It spans uh, 10,000, oh, multiple thousands of years. It's very long and it's very in-depth. And so we wanted to narrow it down, especially pertaining to the uh, time period that we study within the SCA. So what we're doing is a survey. We hope to get you interested in a lot of different things um, and give you just like a little bit of a taste of some of the really cool stuff that we know currently, and then you can go from there and we can actually continue other classes to specialize. 
um, we're starting with this survey of checking out horses uh, in their role through three different lenses. One is of art, written word, and oral tradition. Um, we're going to start with prehistory, and we're going right up to Elizabeth I, I hope, if time pertains, uh, or time, time allows. Um, if you have questions as we go, please write them down, and we will stop in um, for breaks in between to ask a couple questions and keep people going. There's a lot of information, and we don't want to overload you too quickly, but we do want to give you a little taste of what really motivates us to this passion of horses that we have. Um, we'll try to stay on track as much as possible. But please understand, this is the first time um, Allie and I have done a class like this uh, on horses. I don't know that I've ever taken a horse history class at all in the SCA. Um, I've always, always been involved in like, if you're gonna do a horse class, you're gonna ride a horse, you're gonna hit things with a stick. There's a whole lot more to horses within our history and even that can be incorporated in the SCA and the physical active part of it, there's so much history. So we'll try to stay on topic um, and we're really glad that you're here. Ali is going to talk about the evolution of the horse. Let me quiet a minute. So horses as we know them are actually called Equus cabias, and they are the um, current evolution of the horse. If you can see on this picture, um, we originally had the Eohippus or the Dawn horse, which was actually a five-toed horse and was only up to about 12 inches tall. So a little tiny guy, he looks kind of like in some pictures of him, looks like a little tiny meat-eating deer. They were omnivorous originally. And then they evolved into um, Mesohippus, and around the time of Mesohippus is when they traveled away from North America across the land bridge. So horses in general, the Eohippus and Mesohippus were native to Northern America, and then during the land bridge they traveled across, and Equus as we know them today are no longer native here. And the next evolution of horses is Merytippus. Um, in the second picture that I have on the side, you can see how their toes and their teeth evolved away from kind of a, an omnivorous style tooth where they could eat more than just um, veggies and grass into uh, what we know today where it's really just all they can really do is chew in their veggies and grass. Um, and then right before we get to the Equus cabias, you have the Pliohippus, which is the, um, it's the stage of evolution right before Equus. And it's uh, where you can really start to see the features of Equus. Um, donkeys look really similar to Pliohippus. Um, so yeah, and then um, Pliohippus began is where you first saw, first saw the single toe. They still had two toes on their back foot, but um, that's where you first saw the single toe on the horse. And then actually, fun fact, if you compare the horse's front leg, the Equus front leg to our human arm, um, if it looks like the horse is standing on their middle finger. Pretty interesting. It's awesome, I think. All right. The, um, the reason we bring up the evolution of the horse is because when we're talking about horse, uh, the reason we think it's so important is because when you're talking about horse history, the early horse, you kind of have to get a feel for where horses came from. Although answering the question of where horses came from is huge. And there's a whole lot of specialists with a lot more knowledge than I have that don't agree on any of it. Um, 30,000 years ago, horses were food. Uh, and that's roughly 30,000 years ago. Don't quote me to the day. Um, people, humans at the time, ate horses for food. They caught them. Um, they kept horses for food because they were easily adaptable to wherever they lived. Um, they're survivors. At some point around 5000 BCE, somebody, we guess somebody on a dare, was thrown up on the back of one and was like, hey, I wonder if this can move. I wonder if we can ride this thing. Um, whether or not they survived, apparently they did, and uh, got everybody else the idea that we could hop on and ride these things. Um, once that happened, when people figured out that they could domesticate the horse to be more than just a thing of food, that they could utilize these things, um, Evolution happened like that. Uh, domestication happened in lots of different places around a similar time frame, and we're still talking within groups of thousands of years. So there's no one particular place. Um, they talk about um, the Eurasian steppes and like around modern day Kazakhstan being some of the central places, but Spain also had a lot of, of uh, areas of where early horses were found to be domesticated. Um, 
So what, every time they find a new place they think horses came from when they were domesticated, they find a new one to dis disprove it. So I think it's very interesting that nobody agrees. Um, once people copped on a horse and figured out that it could take them from point A to point B, the importance of horses went from food to transportation. Transportation of a physical person is one thing, but they also transferred ideas. And that's where things get really interesting when we start talking about the history of the horse. The horse carried people and their ideas to different places. The three paths that we're gonna follow in, um, in learning this history of the, or the survey of the history of the horse is one through art. We have tons of examples. I could teach like a, you know, a college course, you know, a couple years long of just the art of horses. Thank you so much, Killian, for giving me this idea. Um, carvings, paintings, sculptures, textiles, even the decorations that they put on horses for fittings, uh, trappings, all of these are um, excellent examples of horses in art. There's also the written word. We've got training manuals are some of the earliest things that people wrote about horses. Xenophon uh, was a Greek and uh, philosopher slash horse trainer who wrote down a lot of how to ride, how to train horses for war, how to feed them. Um, he wrote all of this stuff down in really, really early period manuals. Stories and manifests were actually really important for dating how people used horses because they mentioned how many horses needed to be fed how much hay people brought, how much grain they brought with them. If they were traveling from point A to point B, whether it was an invasion, uh, migration, or uh, any kind of movement for, for travel, they would list what they brought with them and what they brought to feed those horses. Uh, breeding rules were very important later in period, excuse me, later in the Middle Ages, um, because once we figured out that horses could do what we want them to do, we wanted to breed specific horses together to get what it was we wanted, whether it was faster horses, larger horses, um, prettier horses, all these different types of things that we started to breed for and people kept track of those, which mare and which stud were put together to get this offspring and they carried that down the line. And that gave us a good idea of where horses were bred, um, what people were breeding for at that time and what the what the um, important part that they found in the horse was at different time periods. Literature, of course, um, Shakespeare, bless him, wrote some really cool stuff about horses and so did a whole lot of other people. Um, the Canterbury Tales is something we're gonna touch on and through a little bit of oral history. Oral history is a little bit more difficult to chat about because obviously it was not written down until much later, but they were spoken uh, oral histories that were passed down to people, not just about the horse, but about the horse as a religious and uh, spiritual animal, a mystical animal. Um, they attributed a lot of that and they wrote and they shared it orally. Um, Greek and Roman myths and deities, we're definitely going to get in those a little bit too, without getting too far off of our course. And the horse had lots of different roles. Um, this is another way that we're gonna track horses through history and the different roles that they had. Because like I said, once they became something for transportation other than food, the, uh, the door was wide open. Transportation, when I mean transportation, I mean things like pack animals, um, people travel, uh, excuse me, mounts for travel for people, individuals, and also for messengers. You had to send a message. A horse got there a lot faster than a lot of other ways. Um, war. Obviously horses were used for war and you can see the pictures on the right. We've got the Bayou Tapestry, which is one of my favorites, a tapestry that's not a tapestry. Um, in war, horses were used in different ways then, whether they were pulling people, whether they were carrying people, or if they were carrying back all of the things that people had won. Agriculture, we definitely used horses in agriculture. We still to this day use horses in agriculture, but we're gonna talk a little bit about how agriculture was a little bit different than what you might think. Leisure in sport is hunting, tournaments, um, using the horse for more than monetary gains. We're using this for fun. And there's a whole bunch of things that we're gonna talk about, including why we bred horses for specific sports. Religion and spiritual importance. Um, the opportunities to speak on this are almost endless. We've got uh, from seeing horses in the stars with constellations to worshiping gods that represented horses or that had horses represent them on the physical plane, um, all the way up into, um, oh my goodness, uh, the gods becoming horses at some points uh, when, when Loki does some fun things with horses, we won't go there. 
Uh, social standing. Uh, so horses also presented people with the ability to show their social standing. Um, how many horses you had, how, what kind of breed of horses or what kind of uh, type of horse that you had, um, and how many horses could you give away to someone. That was a huge thing of social standing. And a lot of people in the Middle Ages used horses in that way um, to prove their wealth, to prove their importance. Um, and again, like I said, the Bayou Tapestry on the right here, uh, I think one of the coolest things that we mentioned, especially since we're starting in travel, is that not only did uh, William the Conqueror ride horses in his battle, but he brought his horses, his horses, as they were being ridden, they brought him to his battle. Well, he brought his horses on a boat. I love the picture on the bottom. He's got the little bitty horse head. You can kind of see him down in here. If you look close, he got these little cute little horse heads sticking up. Um, this shows that not only did he bring all of his people, all of his very important things, he brought his horses with him too. So. We're going to talk about breeds and characteristics. Ali, take it away. So horses as we know them today are categorized into breeds based on um, body, their not necessarily their skeletal structure, but their musculature and the way that the horses are built, what they do, what size they are, and what they're for. Um, but in, in the medieval period, it wasn't, we didn't classify horses into breeds. We just talked about them as types, as types of horses. So on the screen, you can see that there are six main types of horses that were um, described in several books by lots of people. It's one of them is called an ambler. Um, these were old nags. They were your old horses, dead broke, been there, done that. Um, you're good. They were great for inexperienced people. Um, they were favored by people going on um, the Canterbury pilgrimage because a lot of people going, they didn't know how to ride, they didn't ride on a regular base. And what was special and what made these so great for an experienced people because they were comfortable. And they were comfortable because they did what's called a gait. Um, a gait is how the horse's legs move. The gait that they did was called a pace. So today we, um, we call it a pace. And what it is, is instead of, instead of in a base trot where a horse's feet are moving uh, diagonally, where the, so in a diagonal pair, the left front and the right hind move at the same time, but in a pace, it's a lateral pair. So the left front and the left hind move at the same time. And instead of being bouncy like a trot, like we know it, it's, uh, it's really smooth and easy to ride. So a lot of inexperienced people and people who wanted the comfort on a long journey would get an ambler or a pacer. Uh, trotting horses, the direct quote was, um, I got that. Cliff's not yet well used. That was young horses. Oh, oh. young horses. Well, trotting horses were a lot like amblers. They were really broke, um, but they didn't pace. They weren't broke to pace. They did trotting, so their feet moved in diagonal pairs instead of lateral pairs. Um, and then young horses was another classification. Um, young horses, the quote was, colts not, not yet well used to the bridle. So basically, young horses were young horses. Um, the sizer horses, these were pack horses. Um, they were stout with agile legs. They were bulkier. They were used to carry packs. Um, then you had your war horses. Uh, how do you say it? Vestries. Vestries. French. Your war horses. Um, there's actually some really interesting controversy about what the size of a war horse was, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and then there were coursers. These were used for hunting. They were spare, they were spare horses for knights and retinue. These weren't your main horse that you would use. They were, um, uh, they were, they weren't the main horse that uh, someone would ride. They were an extra or they were used just for hunting. Um, and then there was mares. Mares is a female horse. They were in a classification of their own in this area in England. They were um, treated like cattle. They were um, oftentimes seen either in full or with bulls with their size. And I think something really interesting to note is in, uh, in, in Egypt area in this time period, uh, they were breeding Arabian horses and they actually prized their mares over their stallions. And they were the only dangerous to do this because they recognized that the mares are the ones that pass on the majority of the race. The stallion complemented, you paired a stallion to complement the mare. Not the other way around, where it is in British culture and many other cultures, they pin the mare to the stallion. The prize of stallions over their mares. 
Um, so a lot of these breeds, these types of horses, you can see them in modern horses, like an ambler with the pace. Uh, you see them in any of the horses that do, like the Missouri Fox Trotters. And um, so you, you can see that how they, they recognize uh, the horse's propensity to learn that gait and bring into it to create what we know today in the breed. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the size of horses. Um, horses as we know them today, the perfect road horse or riding horse today is around 15 hands. We measure horses in hands, they're approximately four inches or four inches. So literally turn your hand sideways and that's how you measure your horse. Um, so today's perfect horse is around 15 hands tall, but on average, horses were actually only about 13 hands in this time period. And there was a lot of controversy over whether or not war horses were huge, um, upwards of 18 hands, or if they were actually 15 hands, which would have been big for horses back then. Um, I found a lot of contradicting evidence. Uh, a lot of people said these huge giant horses, upwards of 17 and 18 hands. Um, but if you look at the other evidence, like, um, like pictures and the way that they actually measure today, we measure hands in a vertical straight line from the ground to the withers. The withers on the horse is where the neck and the spine meet, and it's the highest non-mobile part of the horse. That's why we measure for the withers. Um, back then, they actually measured, instead of in a straight vertical line, they measured with the contour of the horse's body. So it made the measurements look bigger than they actually were. And then in addition to that, you can see in the artwork that we've got presented here, it's obvious that the horses aren't that tall. If you were to compare an eight, an 18 hand horse, it would be the approximation of a six foot man standing that about that tall. So you can see in the artwork that that is definitely not, that would have to be a very large human to be riding that big of a horse and be that look that big on their back. So um, it was included through the, um, through reading the art, learning about how they measure courses back then, that your war horses were actually around 14 to 15 hand high, which was big, but not as big as a lot of people thought they were. Um, Claire? Yeah? Allie's audio is kind of cutting in and out and getting a bit mushy at times. Is there, is there a way she can sit closer to the mic on your machine? Yeah, do you want to just use mic? Oh, okay, can you hear it? Yeah. So uh, as a small side note, we have pretty much been quarantining together because our because we live down the street yes. and our families are of all a little bit um, uh, immunocompromised. So we've been really careful. So we can do this. We're not sharing our tasty beverages, but we are we, we are at least not breaking any rules. But um, um, I believe I saw a comment on the chat, uh, Caitlin. Yes, you are totally right. The Icelandic horse, she mentioned, I saw her chat message, that the Icelandic horse um, does the tolls. Yes, absolutely. And the Icelandic horse is also about the right height that we're talking about. Um, the reference that Ali and I both found for these particular measurements was, um, his name was um, William Fitzstevens in 1170. He was the secretary and biographer of Thomas Beckett. And so he wrote a lot about what they had at the time. And he wrote a lot about what the different horses that they had. So the different, the different types, you know, type, how many horses we had that were amblers and how many horses that we had that were sumpters. Um, and he actually m mentioned some of those measurements. It was very interesting for Allie and I to, to understand based on our knowledge of what a hand was and how it's measured based on how they've been measuring it, how they were measuring it in the Middle Ages. So, and definitely remember that if you have questions, or if you have comments, please don't, don't forget them, write them down or just send them through the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on it too because I would love to include that in this too. Thank you. All right. This one's really important to me and I hope you guys really like this one. We wanna talk about the horse in art. This is a horse bone. It's a horse engraved on bone. It's 10,000 BCE. It's a rib bone, about 7.3 centimeters from Robin Hood came in Devonshire. Um, this little piece of bone right here is the oldest known work of art in Britain. It's insane. This is so cool. Let me talk to you about this piece. So this piece of bone was found in a cave and it is really, really um, 
smooth. So obviously it was carried around with it for a long period of time. It's broken on the end and they think that maybe it broke off of something that someone was carrying. It was dropped on the ground and that's how it came to be found. Um, this is in the British Museum. Um, if you get a look at it though, you can see, check out this picture here. You can see the eye. You can see his forehead slopes down. They actually drew the nostril in here. He's got a little bit of the chin, the jaw. Here's his chest that goes down. It looks like he's running. Um, at the very top, you see all these little bitty spikes? That's his hair. Um, they have a theory, and I'm sure there's a lot of theories with this, that these little lines in front of this could actually be a corral that it was put into. There's a couple different thoughts. I mean, who knows what this was drawn for, but obviously the person who drew this didn't just consider horses to be food. They wrote, they drew this because it was maybe a horse that they looked at, that they admired, that they thought was an interesting look, that maybe it was their favorite one, but they drew this artistically. To carry around a piece like this, this is 10,000, what is it, like 12,000 years ago. That's insane. This really kind of blew my mind. And from a horse lover's perspective, it was like, it was like kind of shivery. It's a very cool piece. So I hope you understand that we put this guy in here to show you um, the, at the end of our prehistoric, um, you know, discussions, that the horse was definitely more than just food and even more so than just something to carry to carry people around. It meant a lot to people so much so that they made art with, you know, with its image. So horses and transportation, um, they, be, they move people, goods and important messages faster than just about anything else. Um, some of the illustrations that we've got here to show, um, one from the Lutrell Psalter in the 14th century, we've got a couple horses we're hoping those are horses and not mules. It's a little bit of a touch and go on that, that are pulling this big wagon. Obviously, it's getting a little bit of help from people behind. Um, the second one is something I really want to discuss that's both a art image and a written word image. We've got the knight um, from the Ellesmere manuscript of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, 15th century. Um, if you get a good look at this guy, you can tell by the way his legs are in this that two legs on the right hand side are both moving in tandem. So this is a pacer. This is not just a regular horse. It has a gate, a specific gate to it, which is going to give this particular knight a really nice smooth ride if that's what he was going for. If you think about when knights are riding into battle, they're not riding the destriers and they're really gigantic war horses. They're saving those for when they get to battle. Instead, they're riding other horses. So it was important for knights to have multiple different mounts to have, whether they were riding them themselves to battle, whether they were getting their goods, their armor to battle, probably pulled by like a sumpter horse, a pack horse, or if they were getting their retinue that went with them, their squires, their men at arms, anyone in their camp to go with them. They had a whole different amount, different types of horses for those different uh, roles. And by this drawing, you can tell this knight, he's pretty dressed up nicely. He's got some cool barding for his horse and he's riding a very comfortable mount. The third picture over here, we had to put in because it was really cute. Um, this is a miniature of St. Cuthbert from the life, life of Cuthbert. This has a fantastic story and I'm going to pull it up so I get it right. Give me just one moment here. There's a miniature of St. Cuthbert kneeling in prayer. He is interrupted by his horse who finds bread and cheese wrapped in linen hidden within the roof. Um, this is a uh, 12th century, of course, and it's a, a bit of a an artistically hilarious drawing of the saint who's turning around looking at his horse like really really this is what we're doing um, for those of us who are kind of horse enthusiasts we have had this moment where we turn around and go really horse really um so it's really interesting that they that they show his horse's antics in addition to this very holy saint who's doing you know his stuff he's, he's praying he's obviously doing something and his horse is acting up so we have transportation Horses in war. Horses in war is huge. This is, this, we could teach an entire set of classes on this. So we put a couple of examples in here that show the horse in history um, with pertaining to war. First, um, I wanted to mention a horse, a horse, a kingdom for a horse. We have Richard III from, or William Shakespeare's Richard III speaks this. Um, whoop, I'm sorry, wrong button. There we go, pardon me. The thing about Shakespeare's writings about horses, and the reason that I pull him out as writing, not just about there was a horse, but in a lot of Shakespeare's writings, about four or five different writings that he has, Shakespeare specifically calls out the names, the colors, and the types of the horses that people are riding. 
in this particular case, um, when Richard III is asking for his horse, part of the, um, the rest of the dialogue is that um, Surrey was the name of Richard III's horse. We know this because he mentions this. Um, uh, Shakespeare does. In 5.3, Richard offers Rat or, uh, orders Radcliffe, his man at arms, to saddle White Surrey for the field tomorrow. Um, poor Surrey is killed on the battlefield in the next scene, prompting Richard's most famous cry, a horse, a horse, a kingdom for a horse. Um, so we know, um, we know the color that Surrey is. We know his name. We know that he was really important because Richard was desperate to get back, um, he got desperate to follow his pursuers to, uh, or his, the, the winning side that was definitely kicking his butt at the time in this particular play. Um, and it was important enough for Shakespeare to mention his name. We think it's above and beyond what a normal, yeah, this is just a horse. It had more importance to that. On the bottom left here, we have this beautiful piece of armor. Um, this is the Burgundian bard armor. Um, it belonged, it was given as a gift to Henry VIII from, um, from um, uh, Emperor Maximilian I. I was really, really, really fortunate. I got to see this armor in person at the Met um, at the fall of last year. Uh, this is my photograph of it because I can't even tell you the pictures that we found online of this armor, it doesn't do it justice. The armorers went, Maximilian himself was showing off his wealth constantly through his different suits of armor, his different um, gifts that he would give as many people as possible. He didn't have as much money to fund this as he wished he did, but he kept doing this to make himself important. So he almost made himself more important than he really was, although he did marry well, became the emperor, took over a lot of stuff, um, the Roman emperor in that particular time. Um, he raised the art of tourney and horsemanship to a level that he thought it needed to be at. And so he made it very, very important, especially to the point where he gave these really elaborate gifts. Um, this armor, I think they mentioned that they weren't even really sure if it got, ever got used. Um, it's beautiful and it has a lot of specific um, figurative meanings within e the different types of designs that's on there. There's pomegranates on there that was to celebrate Henry VIII's wedding to uh, Catherine of Aragon. You all know how that went. Uh, there is small crosses in there that represent um, the uh, order of the Golden Fleece, which is something that they tried to make to elevate horsemanship and elevate the knighthoods to something even higher. Um, and it's just a stunning piece of art. On the right-hand side is the tournament tapestry of Frederick the Wise, 1490, you know, uh, late 15th century, there we go. Um, when we're talking about tournaments, especially with the, the horse in war, our idea, our, our very simple idea of tournaments from a basic standpoint is a knight's tale. It's when we see two people with lances on horseback running at each other to unhorse the other person. The beginnings of tournaments was not nearly that organized. Tournaments were, they first began because they were a way for lords who maybe were um, the second son, the fourth son, the fifth son, a way for them to compete and gain um, uh, monetary value, to, to gain uh, income because they were not the first son. They weren't going to inherit and they had to find something to do other than go to clergy, which happened very often with the second, third or fourth son. In this case, the tournament scene was not nearly as organized. You had a group of people, um, they could be 200 fighters on either side. And those fighters over a mile's worth of tourney field would go at each other. The point was not to kill the other person, the point was to unhorse them, grab them, bring them back and hold them from ransom. That's where they got their money. They would win ransoms, they would win um, their, uh, their combatants or their, um, their opposites, uh, war horse, their armor, their um, anything of their goods, they would take that as a ransom. And so it was a great way to make money if you were good at it. Now tournaments did evolve into something a little bit more formal later on, but this was the early training, the early practice for uh, men on horseback, to fight, to get better at their trade, and to earn a little bit, uh, earn income, and to support themselves. Now before, actually, I'm gonna pause for a second. Before I jump to agriculture, um, was there any questions? And I know that this is a lot of information. We're still trying to keep it as a survey, but was there anybody who had any questions or wanted to ask us anything? 
We're doing pretty good. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. We're gonna keep on plugging along because we got a lot more. I'm gonna try to go a little faster in the next parts. Horses and agriculture, right? We think horses and agriculture that it must have been a really big deal, right? Horses were one of the last ones domesticated, and the the game changer was these harnesses. So if you get a look at the two different horses on this picture. Now this is a picture that is actually from a Dover publication that's a, a redrawing of some of the illustrations and illuminations that they found. These two pictures, the front horse and the back horse here, show the two different types of harnesses that were used for work horses. The first one on the left um, is a really simple harness that would allow you to pull things, but not really very efficiently. The second one is the collar. And when, excuse me, when the collar was built, and utilized, it was way more efficient. And if you look on the right-hand side, um, the Book of Hours on the right-hand side there, um, it has a, it's a page out of a calendar that has the sowing of seeds, the, um, the, the beginning of um, spring, putting down seeds, and it has a horse there. Obviously, he's riding it rather than um, driving it from behind, and he's got a collar on. So we've gotten to the point a little bit later on, and I believe that that, that is from the 1500s. I'm sorry, I didn't write the date. More. Um, that one there shows that um, they were using horses a little bit later. They still use cattle and oxen up until, I should be more specific, I apologize, around the 1300s is when they kind of started to switch towards using horses more in agriculture. One of the main reasons, other than the, the, the efficiency of the harness, was that horses were faster. You could get a, 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 a field sown quicker with a horse than you could with a, a set of oxen. Horses and leisure and sport. Uh, once we figured out how to uh, fight in war with horses, horses were super efficient. Um, they then became something that we got to play with. We got to take out, we got to go on hunts. Um, you can see on the left-hand side in the Codex Mance, they're taking horses out to do hawking. Um, they're riding them, they're decorating them. Um, on the right-hand side, we have uh, Gaston Phobus's uh, beautiful Book of the Hunt, which that book was a big deal in its time period. The end of the 1300s uh, was when it was put together. What Gaston Phobus was trying to do was to show this beautiful, perfect picture of hunting life. And he shared, he loved hunting. He was a really big hunter. He wanted to share how awesome hunting was. He actually um, talked a lot about peasants having their own horses to hunt. Um, here and there for their lords, of course. And also we kind of talked a little bit about justifying coaching because hunting was so cool, obviously people would want to do it. Um, this is just an image of, of um, a hunter on horseback. He has his, uh, one of his um, servants with the dogs getting ready to flush out some of the games that they can go. The Book of the Hunt is a huge book. It's got a lot of really amazing um, illustrations, or excuse me, illuminations in it um, that showed the different the different stages of the hunt and the different people who are involved in it. And the third part I'm gonna let Allie talk about because that's literally a picture of Allie. Here, I'm gonna turn this. If she gets quiet, please let me know and we'll make it so that she can uh, be heard. Everybody hear me all right? No? No? Hold on just a moment, Barnes. How about now? Is that better? Is that better? Cool. Thank you. So we're kind of using this um, as a segue into um, when horses began to be bred for specific purposes and characteristics. So in this picture, you can see that um, I'm jumping my horse and she's an Arabian. So she is what we call a sport type horse. And they're one of the early representations of breeding for a purpose because um, the Arabians, the Bedouin tribesmen and the Egyptians um, kept track of, they were the first uh, culture to keep track of their mares and studs and who they bred. And they created a horse specifically for doing things like endurance riding and jumping, um, being able to run um, for kind of like this thoroughbred quickly, but um, over longer distances. So that kind of jumps into uh, breeding for specific purposes. Um, even though the Egyptian culture were the first people to keep track of breeding, um, the, the um, culture in England was the first culture to breed for specific purposes. So they recognized when a specific set of horses, a mare and a stallion, were the best at hunting or they were the fastest, 
or they were bigger, so they were better for agricultural work, um, or they were better for war, and they started recognizing that and breeding specifically for those traits. And that's kind of where it starts to, um, horses start to separate into breeds as we know them today. So you've got breeds that have originated from all over the world. Um, you've got breeds that are bred for very specific purposes. Like you've got um, Arabians, which are known for a distance. You've got thoroughbreds, which are known for racing. Um, directly off of them, you've got quarter horses, which are actually bred because they're the best at running the quarter mile. So they're sprinters versus long distance runners. And so we just wanted to mention that uh, th this culture was the first to start practicing selective breeding in horses for specific purposes. Um, that wasn't really great. When we're talking about breeding. Can you hear me okay? So far so good, thanks. Um, the thoroughbred was developed in England, um, specifically for racing and jumping. Um, the origin of that thoroughbred uh, of, the, of our, what we call a thoroughbred comes from three main horses, three main studs that were brought. Um, and those studs have been taught to um, thoroughbred enthusiasts for years. We all know their names. Um, they are the Byerly Turk, um, the um, Darley Arabian, and the Godolphin Arabian. It, it's kind of like almost biblical sense when it comes to thoroughbred people that you have to know who these horses are. But one thing that is really, really interesting is that these three horses, now these were a little bit later in period, I can't really talk about them too terribly much. Earlier than that, Henry VIII, when he came into um, in, when he came into power, his father left him a fat stack of cash. He left him a really good setup, and he Henry VIII kind of blew it. He gave away horses. He spent the money. He went nuts with it. And what happened too is that he said, "Oh my gosh, we got to fix this." We he was the one who started importing more horses to improve breeding. And what it started with was um, both in his reign and a little bit later on in James and Charles's was 43 specific mares. They were called the royal mares. These mares helped restore England's excellent breeding program. And so in the beginning, like earlier during the period that we study in this particular survey, um, they were breeding specifically, but they weren't really great at keeping track of it. Like Ali mentioned, they were better at keeping track of it in other cultures. England was a little bit slower to keep track, but they tried to make up for later on very specific stud books. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, they focused more on the studs than they did on the mares. So, so having that, ah, here we go. Horses in religion and mythology. This is also a really, really, really large section that we could dive into, but we're going to touch on this just a little bit. Um, the statue of Epona is a bronze from the first to fourth century. Um, early Bronze Age peoples um, definitely worshipped, definitely worshipped the horse. Then they treated the horse higher than than just regular domesticated animals. Um, Epona was one of the many gods and goddesses that had horses, uh, she was the main horse god, of course, but other gods and goddesses within those time periods, early time periods, even Norse, um, studied and worshipped horses in this particular sense. They, they associated horses with gods is what I'm, what I'm really getting to. Other than that, horses were looked at in a magical sense also, and in the version of the horse that we're talking about is the unicorn. Um, this is the unicorn tapestries. This is one picture of the two unicorn tap of the, the seven total unicorn tapestries. The unicorn tapestries are very, very interesting. They have a really amazing history to them. Um, originally made at the end of the uh, 14th, or 1400s, um, end of the 16th century, they were made in Brussels. They were used as tapestries in a very well-to-do couple of uh, chateaus, of couple houses. They found their way to France and uh, they were actually commissioned, we believe that they were commissioned for a French nobleman. They hung for many years, right up until the French Revolution. Bad things happened, they were torn down. There's a rumor that they were used to cover potatoes at some point where a lot of the damage happened to them. After that, they were found, they were restored. Um, they have been put back up in certain um, family homes in France. Um, and while we're getting a little bit past the period that we're surveying, I have to finish the story because it's really, really good. Um, 
Rockefeller purchased them. Uh, Rockefeller purchased these tapestries and owned them. In New York, around 1920s, the, the end of the 1920s, um, they decided to build a really amazing museum to house some great um, works of art, the Met. Um, a part of the Met that they also wanted to build was called the Cloisters. It's an amazing museum in uh, Manhattan, uh, Upper Manhattan, New York. Um, that's where the unicorn tapestries now live. The person who funded the Cloisters, one of the many people who funded, because it costs a fortune, um, was Rockefeller, the curator of the Cloisters. Really wanted those tapestries. Really wanted those tapestries. Rockefeller said, you can have them when I die. And the curator was like, oh my God, forever. Who knows when that's going to happen? People, you know, Rockefeller, my goodness, this is the 1920s. So every time that the curator would take the benefactors, all of the people who you know, have pitched in to make this cloister, he would take them through the cloisters and be like, ah, oh, this is our newest acquirement. This is our newest piece that we're displaying. He would walk them into this one room and this one room was empty. And he'd turn to Rockefeller and he'd go, and this is where your tapestries are. These are, these are where the unicorn tapestries are going to go. Every time this curator wore down Rockefeller to the point where he was like, fine, you can have them. And they finally got displayed again. So they were in private ownership for many, many years. But these unicorn tapestries are important because they tell a really amazing story. They tell a story of the, the magic of what they believe the unicorn was, but they also tell a deeper story than that about marriage. And I would love to tell you all about it, but I could tell you like for three or four more hours. But what I will mention is that a lot of us know the story about how a unicorn can only be captured by a pure maiden. And if we get a look, rather anticlimactic, here we go. If we get a look right here, this is one of the seven tapestries that was horribly torn. Um, it was, there's only a two pieces of it left. It's called the fragment. It's the mystic capture of the unicorn. This is the one where they catch it. And this is really high up on the wall in, in the cloisters. What we think, what was, what you can see by looking at this is that the gal here in this picture is the one who catches it, right? Not so much. Get a look at the unicorn. Underneath his chin, you can see some red right here. If you follow it around the unicorn's neck, there's some fingers. It's a hand. Whoever was the actual maiden who captured the unicorn is not in this picture. We don't know where she is. We don't know what happened to her. At some point, these tapestries were torn and this gal up here is not the person who caught the unicorn. We think that what they did was there was, there was a hunting party, of course, in the tapestries that tells the story. There's a hunting party that goes to capture the unicorn. She is the person who sees the unicorn being enthralled by the maiden, motions to the hunters and they come and get it. So it's really amazing that we can look at these tapestries and from a bigger view, we think we know what's going on, but there's little tiny details that give away what they're really talking about in here. And one of them is the hand around the unicorn's neck. It's kind of cool. So one of our last ways that we want to talk about horses is horses in society um, and social standings. Horses were super important. And I think you've probably gotten that point that we've talked about this whole time that Horses were more than just food um, or a means to an end. Um, we've used art a whole lot. We've used literature, uh, written literature. And also in this particular case, we can reference the Havamal. So the Havamal um, has one of, the, one of the two main uh, horse references that they have. This one is number 71, which I really think is awesome. It says, the lame can ride a horse, the maimed drive cattle, the deaf can fight and prevail. It is better to be blind than be, to be burnt. A corpse is of no use to anyone. What they're mentioning is that even if you are absolutely wounded, if you're hurt, if you're, you're, you're done, you can still be useful to other people. So much so that you can ride a horse, that you can drive cattle, that you can, um, that you can fight and prevail. You know, even if you are deaf, you can do these things to not give up. And it references the horse as one of those things that you can do to continue, that it is better not to fade away, to die. And when they, meet, when they say to be burnt, they mean on a funeral pyre. Um, 
a corpse is of no use to anyone, you still have value, even so much as to, you can ride a horse. Um, in the center here, we've got this awesome image um, of one of the stones. Um, uh, it's a Norse, uh, I would say that word, but I would butcher it. Got nothing. We got nothing. It's a fantastic word that's Norse that I can't say, but it's an image stone. And if you look on it, we're talking about social standings. Um, there's Sleipnir on there, Odin's uh, eight-legged horse. Um, this they thought was a, uh, a pyre or funeral stone, uh, possibly to mark somewhere. And so we have, have Sleipnir featured on there. Um, at the top, we we've got um, the most excellent uh, quote from William Shakespeare: "His neigh is the bidding of a monarch." and his countenance enforces homage. He is indeed a horse. Um, Shakespeare didn't just mention, he's a good looking horse, he's pretty. He said his neigh is like the bidding of a monarch. So they, they are, Shakespeare in this particular case is imbibing this excellent amount of, um, how do I say, pardon me. Shakespeare's giving not only basic appreciation to the horse, but he's rising it to that higher level, social standings um, of he is not just good, he, it, he requires homage. And so we feel that this portrays that horses weren't just your regular beast of burden, your regular just messenger. They enforce the bidding of a monarch. And on the bottom right, this was a very interesting little image that Ali and I found that we actually learned something we had never heard before. This is called, this is a, a small image out of the corner of what's called the Mappa Mundi. Mappa Mundi is amazing and I really hope someday to teach an entire class on it. Um, pardon me, I haven't been checking the chat right here. Give me a chance to catch up. <laughs> I will do my best. The Mappa Mundi, okay. The map of Moody is a map that is probably the worst map you've ever seen. It was made in, um, you know, the end of the 12th century, the 1200s. Uh, it is, it is housed in Herf and Hereford Cathedral, and you can actually go to Hereford Cathedral's website, and they have an interactive map. The map is unique in that it shows a lot of different places, all jumbled together as if they were right next door to each other. And in the bottom corner is this little guy right here. This guy is part of a hunting scene. He is riding a speckled horse. Speckled horses were very uncommon uh, in Middle Ages, and so to ride one was a really big deal. Um, there's a couple of different illuminations of kings who are riding horses with lots of funny spots. They look like a Dalmatian, God help them. Um, so not only is he riding this really cool horse, but he has a whole bunch of really neat little harnessy bits on it. And what they think that was on that harnessy bit, to me, was some bells. Bells were really important um, in a lot of different parts of society. Um, and they were very common. I mean, we can trace bells all the way back to Egyptian period. In this particular case, excuse me, on horseback, this guy is riding. He's got these bells on there to tell people where he is. And what we want to talk to you about really quick, the, the, the adorable little guy here from the Mapamundi is going to lead us into the second part of our class, um, just in case we haven't completely lost you yet. The um, second part of our class, we want to share something really cool with you. So first, before I jump into that, I will ask you, does anybody have any questions or anything, you know, they want to ask us, anything they want us to touch back more on? We're doing pretty good on time. I'm pretty proud of us right now. My net was kind of flying through some parts. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, we're right at the halfway point if, if you want to take a drink or... or... Wait, we might end up ending... We're doing, good. We're doing good. We might end up a little early. It was really important to Ali and I that we got this class through to you as quickly as we could because we know that right after this class is evening court. Um, and so I don't want to make anybody late. But I also don't want to skip over anything that people are really interested in. So if you have questions, let us know. So that being said, we're going to jump to the second part of our show. Speaking of bells. These are called croto bells. God, I wish they had a, never, a different name. That's a really horribly unfortunate name. Um, croto bells were used in period, um, my goodness, for a really long stretch of period as uh, lots of different things other than, you know, they were decorations, obviously, but they were also wonderful noisemakers. 
um, these particular crotobelts on the right here, I believe they are bronze. They were made of bronze. Modern day ones are made of brass because it's a little cheaper because they're still used today and we'll talk about that. But crotobelts are not actually real bells. They are um, a small dome shape that's closed that has a pea on the inside of it. A pea of some, not an not a, a actual vegetable pea, we're talking a small bead or pea or something of metal to make a sound. Um, I had mine sitting out, but I think they ran away. I have a few of these. What I used them for was I strapped them to my son when he was a baby, and so whenever he'd run around events, I could hear him. It was like 50-50 chance. Proto bells are interesting because riders, specifically equestrians in, um, my goodness, a really big stretch of our time period that we're studying, put them on their harnesses to alert people where they were. Um, now, they're technically, like I mentioned here, they're technically rattles. Um, there is a gentleman named Jason Kingsley, OBE, which is the order of, um, it's a British, order of British excellence. Um, this gentleman uh, runs a YouTube show that's called Modern History Television. And he researches historical stuff with horses and recreates it. Um, in January of this year, he put out a really cool video that I, that I swear to God, everybody shared it with me, um, that talked about what croto bells were and how they would have worked. He investigated the use of them on harnesses, whether or not they would actually notify people, uh, or actually whether or not they would actually make noise. So he tested them on his horse. It's a really cool video. If you're really interested in it, I will send you the link to it. You should totally check it out. Um, we watched that video and we thought, this would be awesome. We should try this. So we made, we put them to the test. What we did was um, I, I had Allie bring her very wonderful mare out to my house yesterday. Because why do anything ahead of time? We brought her out yesterday and we packed her up and we took a set of bells and we had Allie ride back and forth with bells. Now, our initial, we're trying to do a bit of a scientific test here. Our initial test was to see whether or not you could hear those bells like uh, Mr. Kingsley's um, video. And we found, yes, you absolutely could. We wanted to push the test one step further. If you were a peasant walking down the road, say you were coming back or, for, coming back or going from somewhere, you're walking down a path, could you hear those bells in enough time to tell you that there was a horseman coming for you to move? And could it tell you what speed that horseman was coming at? So we did this video and um, I do a little bit of explanation. Please bear with us. We are not professional videographers. We've actually never really done this before, but we thought it would be kind of a fun trial. Um, I do a little bit of explaining, but what we do is we jump into this video at first, to give you examples of our control group, which is Allie walking back and forth, walking, trotting, and cantering past me, to see whether or not I can hear her. And the second part is we attach the bells to Emma's saddle, or her horse Emma, and we have her walk, trot, and canter. We think we've answered our question pretty well, but we'd like to see what you guys think. So watch our video and tell us what you think. Uh, before we get started, any questions? Are we good? Pretty much? All right, so I'm going to turn off our. This for a second. Give me just a second and we'll pull up my video. I'm talking backwards. All right. So before I start, can everybody see this video? Pretty much? Good to go. Thank you. Everybody good? All right. Cool. So I hope that you can hear this video. I'm gonna get it started if you can't, um, especially you, Miss Amanda, if you wouldn't mind giving me, you know, uh, oh my God, this is not working type of thing so that I can tell. I think we've tested it enough times that you guys can hear it. Um, check this out, tell us what you think. Now, wait a minute, I might have to check my sound. We were testing out bells and being able to tell whether or not a rider who's coming up behind you is either walking, trotting, or cantering. Um, we've decided to use um, these jingle bells as uh, an example of what crotal bells would sound like. Essentially, they're the same thing. Crotal bells weren't really true bells. They were more like a rattle. And so these guys were great. So our test for this is the wonderful Allie and Emma. 
And as they walk by, you can hear the sound of the hoof prints or the hoof steps. You can hear the grass moving. Right now, we've stood here next to the river with a little bit of wind in the trees to try to mimic having other background noises. Um, normally, a person walking down a road, maybe leaving market to head home, would have a bunch of other people with them. They would have other noises, maybe carts, other riders. To hear a specific rider or a group of riders coming at something faster than a walk, you would need something to give you some warning. For our test, for the second part, we're going to have her come by at a trot. Listen with no bells and see what it sounds like. Now, Emma has a really nice smooth trot, which is great. However, she's also really quiet. So hearing a difference between a walk and a trot would be very hard to do. I bet you she was only probably three or four, maybe five feet away that I could actually hear her before she was right up on me. Okay, so now we're gonna have her come by at us at a canter. I definitely hear that there's a horse there. But how far away is she from me? Closer than I thought. Okay, and now we put the bells on uh, the front of Emma and asked Allie to bring her by at a walk. I can definitely hear her sooner, and I can tell by the, the fact that the bells are not anywhere in a pattern, they're just going, generally jingling, that she's not really coming too terribly fast. All right, and now we're sending her by at a trot. When I can really hear her, I'll give you the thumbs up. Keep going. We'll get her to start. I can definitely hear her. When a horse trots, it has a two beat motion. Opposite feet, diagonally, one and one and one and one. You can hear that in the bells because they have a jingle that's dum, 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 instead of just a general jingling randomly. And now we're gonna ask her to go by at a canter. I can hear it coming. get out of the way but I know it's Emma and Emma's a really really safe and very controlled horse and Allie's also a really controlled rider so I didn't move out of the way but I could hear her in the difference of the beat with the bells there was a three beat with the canter outside of just the hooves you can tell that there was bells too and now we've asked Allie to do the last bit with Emma which is started at one beat and then it changed her stride and then go back to the other one see if we can hear the differences you can see her but close your eyes and see if you can hear her That's a trot. That's a canter. Stay out of canter. And now you can see it here going to the trot. I don't know if the camera can pick that up as much because the mic is directional, but she did then change to a trot when she got a little bit farther down. All right. Okay. So that's our test on how bells work in letting. Uh, uh, pedestrians know when horses are coming by based on the beat, whether or not the bells are for a trot or let's say all of this would be a walk. And then of course the canter, which would be a nice three beat, which I can't mimic with a bell by hand. But Emma does an amazing job of it. Thank you, Allie. Thank, Thank you, Emma. And here we are walking back. <laughs> you can tell Emma, is that a walk? Now that we've done our experiment. And she can also pick up a trot. We'll get a little bit better than just a butt shot. There we go. And off at a canter. And an extra thank you to Crispin 
who put up with all of our weirdness and did a lot of my videotaping for us. So there you go. Thank you. That was a blast. Um, let me throw back up the end of my... All right. So we had a blast. We had a lot of fun doing that test. We must have done like, oh my gosh, like 20 passes to get that right. Um, what we wanted to talk to you really quick, which I I neglected to mention earlier, was the idea that um, uh, that in the SCA, you know, we study history, right? Um, my very good friend. Uh, mentioned this to me that it's um, experimental archaeology where we know that they used bells we know they put them on horses and it's one thing to hear someone tell you oh yeah that's what they did you know this is how this worked um, it's a whole nother ball game to actually try and do it yourself and try to recreate it um, I think it's a really um, strong point to what we study in the SEA to actually take something and recreate it as as closely as we can um, within the level that we can. Part of what we did um, to begin this particular experiment was Allie brought her horse over, um, warmed her up as best as possible, and we were really, really safe when it came to testing to make sure Emma was okay with bells. Emma's been exposed to a lot of things. Like Allie said in the very beginning, she's kind of her unicorn for a lot of great reasons, um, in that she's willing to do some crazy stuff. But bells, when you start moving things from jingling harness that's normally on your saddle to bells that are next to your neck or next to your face. Um, there was some word that uh, these crotal bells were actually hung from the horse's head because that was one of those parts that would move with the gate and so you could hear them louder. Um, we tested her out a bunch to make sure that she would be good with doing this. It was, it was really eye-opening to be able to try it out and test it for ourselves and to stand there and to be able to hear her coming up behind us. It was a lot of fun. So we're glad we got to share that with you. Um, and hope that you enjoyed that one too. The, uh, we still strongly encourage you to check out uh, Mr. Kingsley's uh, video and I will do my best to, to try to put some uh, links to those, those out there. You can actually search for it on Modern History TV on YouTube to, to do the original one and get uh, even more opportunities to check out people who do experimental archeology span and take some of these things that we learn that we pick up from the SEA and put them out to try out. Oh yes, uh, like Ali said, his horse is spectacular. Any real horse person is gonna drool over that pony. And so we kinda got to the end of our class all of a sudden. Oh my goodness, and we're doing really good on time. I'm really proud of us. Thank you. Um, this quote I really wanted to share with you was from one of my main sources that I used um, for this particular class. No animal has had a greater impact on the human civilization than the horse. Um, it makes you think about the animals that are a part of our lives as humans. Um, we think the first animal that comes to my mind, being a dog person, is dogs, dogs, cats. Um, how have these different creatures impacted our, our lives? And how have they, in fact, in this particular case, the horse took it so much further than that and affected our civilization from our transportation, from the way that we did war, from the way that we um, plow our fields and um, gather our harvests, to um, how we look at um, our deities, how we associate um, different religions, spirituality, faith, and then also how we um, socially. Uh, how we apply social standards and social ranks to other people. The horses had a part in all of those things. And so um, below on here is some of the great references that we used. Um, uh, I highly suggest any of these books, plus there are so much more out there if you're really interested in horses. Um, we really appreciate being able to teach. And do you have any questions for us? Do you have anything, anything we can answer or talk about, oh, how big are the crotobels? The crotobels, okay, they came in all different sizes. Um, I found later period examples that were rather large. Um, we're talking jingle bell sized. And actually, 
I'll be back. Have any other questions that I can answer while she's getting her bell? Um, the bell experiment was really fun. Um, I had a blast doing it. My horse is a rock star and put up with a lot from us yesterday. I actually, Ali, I have a question. Yes. As having done about a bit of research myself on a variety of different topics. I would always find that one thing that would pull me down the rabbit hole, the, that new bit of something that, I, that was different than what I thought. What was that for you in this research? Um, there was a lot of that during this. It was really hard to nail down what we really wanted to focus on and talk about. And for me, it was honestly learning about like the sizing of horses because it's a lot of people believe that horses were a lot bigger back than they were, and they're actually a lot smaller. And so I spent a lot of time researching and learning about sizes and about selective breeding and stuff like that. It was really interesting. What about you? I think, oh, let's see. I don't know, that, that um, the, um, what was it? Pardon my, I can remember here, what was it? The, uh, the Mapa Mundi, this little guy here. <laughs> he nice. like completely captivated me. Um, he really, he, he was really interesting. Um, it was definitely a rabbit hole and it wasn't even really a horse rabbit hole, which is like normal for me, where um, I found this and I started to check it out and look at the Mapa Mundi. It, it is huge, this is like a really big thing. Um, and they have an interactive map where it started to talk about how the Ill the illuminators who did that work put the craziest stuff in there. And I really like the obscure and the, the creative. Um, they put critters in there, they put different beasts in there, they did different types of buildings. Um, I, I thought that was really cool. And I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to looking into that more. The fact that dude is riding a, um, a speckled pony uh, and that speckled ponies were special considering the fact that Allie and I both, um, our heart horses are speckled ponies. Um, that was kind of cool. You know, it really kind of connected with what we were doing. Um, the, uh, oh, to answer Bellowin's question, this is my own little tiny set of proto bells. I will hold these, let me do this, as you can see. I don't know if you can hear them. They're really quiet. I took these out thinking, ah, this is totally what I'm going to, uh, um, this is totally what I'm going to attach to the horses and this is what we're going to use. And as soon as I walked out there with Emma and I did this, I'm like, oh no, that ain't gonna do it. So um, we ended up using um, a, set, oops, a set of those jingle bells. Now here at our ranch, um, we've got a bunch of draft ponies um, and we have, my husband, my husband has a really long history of driving horses. And so he was like, oh yeah, I've got these jingle bells and these jingle bells and these jingle bells. So we could have had strings of jingle bells like hanging off of poor little Emma um, from Joe's, uh, you know, Clydesdale driving day, or Pritchard, excuse me, uh, driving days. Uh, so he, you know, gave us some of those and we were really creative on how we put those bells on Emma. Some of the first takes we did with our video, um, we put the bells along the back of her cantle and that didn't work at all. And we realized it's probably more due to my videotaping, uh, abilities or lack thereof that made it work because the microphone was only very specific. Um, I have a GoPro 7 which is an amazing little uh, video camera, but it has a very specific microphone. I can get adaptions for it. If money was no object, I'd have a huge setup. But uh, we, if we moved those bells to the front, um, it was a little bit easier to hear, but we still got you know, a lot of the really cool sound from the changing of the gates. I was kind of pleasantly surprised that they came out that way. Um, let's see, what else? Have, let me get up here to the chat and make sure. So, uh, Brown, does that answer your question? Oh, and you, and, oh, so Caitlin, hi, you're from East Kingdom. That's awesome. Hi. Um, <laughs> if you are only from uh, four hours away from the cloisters, I am extremely jealous. Um, like I said, I got to go there uh, just in, in December. 
we spent an entire day there. Uh, it was raining. It was pouring rain. It was cold. I didn't get to go into any of the gardens. The gardens on the outside are amazing. I would love someday to teach a class just on the cloisters because the, the way that this particular museum in Manhattan is set up, it has four different sections. And those four sections are pulled. They are literally stones that they took from, like say France, and rebuilt in the uh, her west side of Manhattan to build its own cloisters area that you can see today. Um, it, it's amazing. I, I, I definitely think you should go to the cloisters. You should have a seat on the bench in the Unicorn Tapestries room. Uh, if you're anything like maybe me or, you know, Allie, if you're into horses or if you're anything like anyone in the SDA, you're going to sit there and just kind of breathe it in and it's kind of magical. Be prepared because I kind of got a little dusty eyed because it really is. It's a very moving thing to see these gigantic tapestries. And we were lucky enough that one of the um, curators came through and was giving a tour bless his heart he had a tour of like 15 of the oldest people you've ever seen bless his heart he he put up with a lot of really really crazy questions my husband and i are sitting in the back we're, we're kind of history buffs we'd already known what the tapestries were but he talked even more about what these tapestries were what they meant to people um what the spiritual meaning behind them was i'll give you a hint it's not unicorns it actually represents something else um, but I will let you discover that on your own because it is worth going through the process to, to discover um, and to learn about. Uh, Peace keeping Queen's champion. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, ma'am. You are our people. Um, you happen to be in a, uh, a room full of other people who are also people. So I'm glad you're here. Um, does anybody else have any other questions that we could answer or even something pulling off of here that you'd like to hear more about, because we can tell you stories all day long. Yeah. Pretty good. You guys doing all right then? Let's see. Oh, 5.22. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, let's see. Oh, and you don't have to just do the chat. If you want to shout out, we can open this up. Um, Gomez? How are we doing over there? Yeah, no reason we can't. Uh, let me see. I can unmute people. Let me smooth this out of the way so I can get to people. Aha, now I can see everybody. Okay, so yeah, everybody. Uh, uh, I said unmute. You know, and I know it's a small group of us. It's oh. sending us an invitation saying that you would like us to unmute. Okay. So it's oh, leaving cool. it up to us, but you can't getting us to unmute. Okay. Thank you, know, you guys. That was a lot of fun. That was it? Did you like it? Was it yes, good? It was Thank really you. Uh, that, the, the bell thing was especially cool because, yeah, that was like, actual actual experimental archaeology in effect right there that was cool. yes oh I'm so glad you guys liked it um i gotta tell you ellie and i like we've damn near lost sleep over this um being the crazy <laughs> the technically crazy horse people that we are um we always worry that you know it'll be uh not nearly as much fun for everyone else as it is for us <laughs> but i have a feeling that a lot of people in you know historical research i mean being that we're in the sca you know, there's probably more than just us who feel that way. Like, oh my gosh, I wonder if anyone loves, you know, hand embroidery as much as I do. Uh, so this is definitely our geek out type deal. Um, this, this class is definitely a labor of love. So I'm so glad to be able to share it with you. Um, thanks. Thanks for coming to our class. Nice job. Thanks. And I think I got everybody's information except maybe Althea down there on the on, on the side. If if you toss your 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 name and your local group into the chat, I can make sure you get uh, credit with the collegium as well. Caitlin, I'm so glad you you joined us from all the way over there. Might as well. Uh, unfortunately, the barns up here have been closed for the past two months because of the virus. So, got to get a horse fixed somewhere, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I feel you. Yeah. Get a chance to meet you. Hmm? Oh, I'm really well. glad to get a chance to meet you. 
Um, yeah, we don't have quite as large of an equestrian program over here in Artemisia as we used to. It's kind of kind of ebbed and flowed, depends on on the ability of people to run it. It's a, I mean, I'm sure as you know, it's a huge time suck for anyone in the SCA to not only do their SCA stuff, but then to also do horse stuff. Um, and getting and horses across eight lines to do things in competitions is another added layer, as I recall. Yeah. Um, up here, states can be very small, and unfortunately you need vet checks and things of that nature to cross into another state, so that can definitely be fun. Oh, we totally know how that goes. Our kingdom is really long and spans, what do we got, like five different states in here? One, the four, something like that. We got a lot. Um, yeah. Seven hundred and eighty-six miles. Freaking states! You can drive like twelve hours and not like be anywhere near the borders. I mean, you can, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Well, um, I think. Meanwhile, I live in Boston and can get to what five states within an hour. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're we're in, we're in Boise here. The nearest barony to our barony is a solid three-hour drive in, 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 in a couple of different directions. Yeah. Um, let's see, was there anything else that I wanted to, that I could share with you guys? Like I said, we, we started, when we started throwing things into this class, we're like, oh my gosh, we really need to tear this thing down, you know, trim it down. And so we might have done more than we thought we could. Um, what else? Oh, I think that's, I think that's the best that we can give you today, at least. Um, I, I, like I said, thank you again so much for all of you for coming. Um, and I think I'll let you guys go because I know Gomez, you probably need a break, dude. This is what your sixth class that you posted so far today. Oh, just just the third. <laughs> Was that all? Dude. It's like a two hour long class. <laughs> oh my God, that's right. We did keep you. And you've been, you've been doing a bunch of others too. So I'll let you go. Plus we've all got court here at um, six o'clock. And um, oh. we, Miss Allie, should go refill our tasty beverages. All right, so thanks again for coming. And I hope to see you all soon again at some point. And thanks so much. Thank you for putting everything together. Absolutely. You're very welcome. <laughs>